All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining for our second CLTC Arts event. Um, we're very happy to have you here virtually to join us for this conversation. My name is Nick Merrill. I direct the Daylight Lab at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. And about a year ago, uh, we at CLTC embarked on something totally new for us, funding artists. Uh, we were fed up with hackneyed portrayals of hackers in hoodies and green padlocks and ones and zeros flying by, a um, set of imagery that really hasn't been updated since the original Matrix film in 1999, the absolute latest. And we decided that cybersecurity needed a new, more inclusive and more global visuality. It's uh, part of our ongoing effort to expand and redefine uh, cybersecurity's representations, what cybersecurity is, whom it affects, and who gets to do it. So we ended up funding a number of artists on projects that we thought could help address this issue, and Lauren McCarthy is one of those artists. So with that out of the way, I'm gonna hand it over to Salome. Uh, Salome Asega is an artist and researcher based in Brooklyn, New York. She's currently a Ford Foundation Technology Fellow landscaping new media arts infrastructure, and is also a director at Power Plant, a digital art collaboratory in Bushwick, Brooklyn. That's where my mom was born. Salome received her MFA from Parsons at the New School in Design and Technology, where she teaches classes on participatory design and sound art. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here today. Thank you so much for uh, to the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, Rachel and Nick, for having me. I'm looking forward to my conversation with Lauren in a bit, but first we're going to show a clip from the project, and just to set it up, um, in a one-week durational performance, the Virtual Care Project embodied the role of AI functioning as a remote virtual caregiver in 80-year-old Marianne's home in North Carolina. They were able to watch over Marianne, 24 hours a day, speak to her and were able to fully control the lights and appliances within her home via a custom smart home system they created. The performance and resulting documentation gives a lens into questions around remote care, surveillance, and AI in an aging population. I was introduced to this program by David Leonard. I'm not sure what my goals are within this service. I live alone and my son and daughter-in-law travel quite often. At these times, I have no connections to outside help. If I develop problems, I have no way to travel to the doctor. If I become ill, I have no energy or concern to manage my medications. I am new to the area and I have no one to call for help. When, when they are around, they take care of my every need and are concerned. But when they travel for their work, there is no backup system. I just turned 80 and I'm still capable of moving around when I am well. I would like your opinion if you, if I could fit in this program. Thank you. Great. So in bringing Lauren to the virtual stage, I'm going to read a brief bio. Uh, Lauren Lee McCarthy is an LA-based artist examining social relationships in the midst of surveillance, automation, and algorithmic living. She's the creator of P5JS, an open source web platform that aims to make creative expression and coding accessible and inclusive for artists, designers, students, and teachers. Lauren is also an associate professor at UCLA Design Media Arts. Welcome, Lauren. Hi. Hi. Um, so we're just going to dive right into some questions. Um, so what motivated you to do the Virtual Caring Project? How was it connected to or different from your previous work? In particular, I'm thinking about projects like Lauren or someone that also impact the use of smart home, uh, smart home intelligence. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so I've been doing this series of works that were all about kind of thinking about the role of um, AI assistance coming into the home, which for me felt like this very 
intimate space, like uh, kind of a new boundary being crossed and without a lot of questioning, it seemed. Um, so I've been doing different variations or projects around that where like I would service the AI in different people's homes um, in a piece called Lauren or a piece called Someone where uh, it actually um, engaged visitors in a, in, a, in a gallery to peek into different people's homes and control. And with this project, um, I was working with a, my collaborator, David Leonard, and we were really thinking about um, the idea of uh, aging and just, you know, it, it already feels like a space that's very vulnerable to bring um, AI assistance in. But when you're thinking about an aging population, we were noticing on one hand that um, it was happening a lot. Like I was talking to a lot of friends or colleagues who said like, oh, my parents, you know, we installed a camera system or we got Alexa or something like that to help. So we're seeing it filling this um, gap of, of need and care. Um, but on the other hand, like wondering, you know, are, do these systems really provide adequate advocacy and care for this population? Mm -hmm. So we wanted to really just like interrogate that question and do it in a way where um, we're sort of just feeling it out together and seeing like, what does this space provide? Mm -hmm. um, in developing the project, you referenced an AARP study which found almost 87% of American seniors would likely stay in their homes as they age. Um, and then we were talking in preparation for this about care work. And I'm wondering, can you talk a bit about what it means um, to you to release a project about remote care in a time where we are for the most part remotely connected because of the pandemic? How is this project um, shape the way you're currently thinking about care. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when we did the project, <laughs> we weren't in this um, current situation, but really thinking about that idea of remote care and what that means. And um, yeah, the study that you mentioned where people want to, elderly people have like increasingly wanted to stay in their homes, but then also increasingly, I think there is just less of this, um, uh, model where children are living in the same area or in this um, proximity with their parents to be able to help. Um, so a lot of times that need for care is kind of filled in with different remote systems, whether it's like a video chat or um, different assistance like this. And um, it's funny because then like for me, the project has kind of taken, so when we were exploring that originally, it felt like something that for me personally was a little bit further away. Like think, you know, not having parents in that situation directly. Um, but I think as we have been in this pandemic for the last few months, the project has kind of taken on new, um, new meaning for me to just think about like, what does that uh, act of care actually mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that was really came up for me a lot in these projects was realizing how much just presence matters. That when I would talk about the system, a lot of times people would be interested in, in like, oh, and what could you control? And what did you turn on and off? And um, I can do all those things. But what I found was often most affecting for people is just the, this idea of having this remote presence or you know even human presence with them in their home. Um, and I think over the last few months, that's been something that I've been noticing a lot like what are the ways that we're able to be present with each other even when we physically can't um, be together and what does that look like and is it and um, also on the flip side like at what point does like I had moments where it felt like wanting to check in or wanting to offer care but also sometimes like responding to other people's check-ins and offers like that was was almost like an emotional burden sometimes um, mm -hmm. And so finding this balance between um, like negotiating that, that desire to be present or that um, wanting to offer care while also giving people space and all that happening while you have like only some sense of what's happening on the other side, like that um, it, it just, it feels like there, there has been a bigger gap of like trying to kind of negotiate just knowing that the other person could be in many different <laughs> places. Yeah, I love this meditation on presence because I mean it's so impossible to do any kind of planning in this moment, right? So just um, 
I love what you're saying around presence. And I've, I've also just, in learning about this project, I've begun to think about um, Lauren and someone in, in this work as kind of this unit of work around um, care, both self and collective. So it's, it's great to hear you kind of connect the dots between these three. Um, and thinking again about this A, RP statistic, I'm curious, what are opportunities um, that you see for AI to address the emerging crisis of care? And in the same line, what are maybe some things that are starting to happen that we should be critical of? Yeah, um, I think on one hand, it, um, it offers a structure. It can, it can, I noticed that um, from, you know, the different tools and systems I've looked at and also our own, um, interactions with Marianne, it felt like one of the things we could really offer was this like regularity um, that like just helping someone kind of stay with certain patterns, um, go to appointments, do the things that they want to do. So not necessarily like imposing a structure, but just trying to respond and um, support that. Um, and I think that's one where it hits an edge for me because um, it feels so easy to slide into like, oh, well, we know what the best structure would be. We know what you should be doing. Or we notice this and, and here's the action that you need to take. Um, and I think there, there's always a balance there because um, on the one hand, like, yeah, maybe an objective uh, kind of analysis could un, uh, surface patterns that you're not realizing yourself, but on the other hand, like what is the value system that's going into um, those kind of cause and effect or like if this, then that um, mm -hmm. models that are being made. Um, I think another big concern is just like privacy and data. So seeing increasingly how um, like health insurance companies are trying making moves to integrate, you know, just like fitness data or other kinds of metrics that are collected into um, like health insurance premiums or the cost of medical care. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest concerns for me is just like uh, that um, uh, we, you know, by utilizing these systems ourselves, we're also often handing over the data without much understanding of what's happening with it. And I think this is specifically a problem for this um, population because they're, um, yeah, it is one of the more vulnerable populations. Um, on the other hand, I think one of the things that this series of projects has shown me is just, um, and I don't know how to feel about this because I'm in general pretty critical of, of bringing AI into the home. And, uh, but on the other hand, I see, I think one thing we see right now is like these systems often respond to like the most universal needs. It's like everybody needs a light bulb turned on or uh, the song to play or whatever. Um, and where the project has gotten really interesting for me is when people have very specific needs and we're able to respond to those. And it makes me wonder like what happens, you know, because AI can be used to make things extremely customized. So what happens when we start to go down that path of much more customized, um, responsive systems, uh, you know, versus the kind of like, here's the list of things that Alexa can do and everyone has the same set of them. Um, and I also wonder about uh, what it opens up in terms of like, what are the things you might ask of these systems that you don't even necessarily feel comfortable asking of a person that, you know, in your home? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious um, what Mary Ann's experience was like in, in this project and if you were able, can you just speak generally about her in, involvement and also just what kind of conversations you were able, maybe able to have um, as an artist and participant about some of these like deeper things you're addressing now around security and privacy and data? Yeah. Um, so date. David, my collaborator, made the connection with Marianne and got her, you know, sort of interested in, involved in the project. And um, she was kind of, she was such a great, like, collaborator, participant in this because she was really, like, um, she was a really open person and she just 
you kind of just got it. So, you know, we explained the premise of like, okay, there's this sort of AI system, um, but it's run by us, like Lauren and David as the humans behind it. So we're gonna, you know, and she's totally down for it as we're installing everything, you know, throughout her house. And um, also trying to make sure that like, with all these projects when we're installing, um, that it's very, that um, negotiating this like vulnerability and also like consent. Um, and so we're doing that with her and we begin the project and it was a week that we spent in her home um, remotely. And it was, she was so, like she just totally got it, the whole premise, but she also was like, like I don't think in her head she was like oh but there's humans and then there's here's the thing it was just kind of like this is my system and she named it like or she kept calling it IA instead of AI so she named it like IA Susie um, and it, for her I think that was one of the most interesting things was like it just kind of came together in her head like whether it was human or um, artificial intelligence wasn't so important it was more about like having the system um, and so then she was really open to just like exploring what it could do, you know, and like, can you remind me to do that? Or can I tell you the story about this? Or can we talk about that? Um, and I think of any of the performances that I've done, she was one of the most engaged. Um, and I think another part of that was like, she spends a lot of time in her house, you know? So um, I think just to have some company was very welcome for her um, mm -hmm. and to also have company in the in in the capacity of like you can kind of turn it on and off and or ignore it or not um, and so yeah I mean when we were leaving it was like the, this very kind of sad moment of <laughs> deinstalling everything and taking taking it away um, so I don't know she showed me a lot about the project even though I've, I've done it for you know in different forms for different people um, I think she, of all the participants, really responded to it as just like this entity or this presence. And so then that opened up a lot of space to um, in, uh, embody that presence and to explore like, what is the role that we can take on given that? And so I think it was this, um, uh, you know, trying to be helpful or supportive um, while having sort of our own agency and some of the decision making. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Lauren, your work is um, so playful and does an excellent job of um, creatively providing people on ramps for talking about these meaty and generally opaque topics. Um, and along with being an artist, you're an educator, you're an organizer. So I'd love to hear you talk about um, your motivations and approaches to making discussions about AI and automation more, more accessible. Mm. Um, yeah, I feel like a, a lot of times these, we're given this idea that it's like these black boxes that we couldn't understand or it's just talked about as a huge concept. Um, and so then when you start to try to have conversations with people about it that haven't, you know, been thinking about it a lot, um, it feels like, oh, well, like too hard to understand or even if I do like nothing that I can really do about it. And so I think with my work, one of the things that's um, really important to me is trying to like first give people more relatable metaphors for understanding. So trying to bring it to a scale where it's like, okay, I can understand what that means in the context of my life right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then also by sort of like building my own systems or hacking them or playing with them. It's trying to like put this idea out there that uh, we do have some control. We do have some agency in this. Um, these things are hackable. And uh, I hope that it, you know, that goes for artists working with these tools, but also I hope it goes a little bit beyond that to just like people that are interacting with these systems and, um, you know, considering whether they want to use them and how. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For even going beyond um, the artist circle, the artist communities, um, how do you hope this project, Virtual Caring, might help reshape the way policymakers, civil society, or the pri private sector understand security? 
Are you already having conversations with people in these spaces? Yeah, um, I think what happens, the way that I connect to that question most is like often what will happen is because like I'm using the internet as one of the main sort of platforms or places to put the work. Um, what I like about that is that it opens it up a lot. It's like you don't have to end up in a gallery or in a uh, art space to encounter it. And so, and by using things like videos and websites and um, social media, it's like it can often come across the desk of people that um, are in really different sectors and might even be working on these technologies as either like policymakers or designers or developers themselves. Um, so it's always really interesting and like I'll get emails from, you know, people on the like Alexa design team or something like that um, wanting to like chat, which <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, I hope that that is not just like, a, oh, that's kind of a funny idea and move on, but that it actually provokes some questioning. Mm -hmm. um, and from some of the conversations that I've had with people working on these tools, I feel like that is, is the case um, for, for a certain segment of people maybe. Um, and uh, I, I, the question of policy is really interesting with you just brought up in the question in, in the question that you asked and um, I don't know so that's something I've been thinking about more lately I mm -hmm. think maybe we all have of just like realizing that a lot of the systems and policies around us are actually you know they should serve us or they are should be it should be a participatory system mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking about starting to think about like how does that intersect with the work that I'm trying to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um I'm, can you talk a little bit, maybe walk the audience through some of the logistics of the project? How long were the cameras in the in the homes? Uh, were there agreed upon times where the cameras would be live? What what parts of the home were you able to access? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the the overall thing lasted for a week, and one of the things that we did differently with this piece versus some of the other performances was that we were actively trying to collect documentation. Um, so uh, but previously when I had done this, um, I didn't, nothing was recorded. Um, at most I would kind of go through and see if there were, sorry, I didn't quite say that right. So everything was like recorded with the understanding with the participant that, um, Basically what would happen is after the performance, I would go back and if there were any little clips that I wanted to use, I would run them by them. Like, can I use this? And then mm -hmm. if anything they said no to was deleted as well as like everything else besides the, the clips that I wanted to save. Um, with the hope that like this would give a sense that um, you're not gonna be like caught on camera, you know, and used in some way that you don't feel comfortable with. Um, so trying to create open up a little bit more of that ease even even while you're surrounded by <laughs> um, a system like this. And this one was different. Um, I think Marianne was really open to it, to just being part of this um, sort of film that we were trying to make. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about how to um, document that. And we ended up actually making like our own kind of hacked 360 cameras to capture the views in the room. Um, because most like 360 cameras, you can't record like a week straight. Mm -hmm. um, so we were actually like using actual like surveillance systems and like parts of that and reconfiguring it for our own needs. Um, not systems that are like broadcasting somewhere, but just like, you know, literally the, the hardware that you would do if you were doing like a home surveillance system. So it was really interesting to like get into that space and like see these warehouses of, um, you know, components you can use. So we ended up like trying to make our own 360 cameras by putting these like fisheye cameras together um, and had one in each room of the house. Um, and then that was like the recording setup. And then we, in terms of the remote control setup, it was um, like a series of lights, switches, appliances. Um, uh, yeah, I think that was pretty much it that were throughout the house. Um, and so there was an interface where we could 
watch from any uh, any of the cameras and then um, respond to like if she asked us to do something we could turn it on or start that but um, we could also kind of take action without her uh, direct request so trying to anticipate what she might want or need and do that um, and yeah so the filming part was new for this because we were interested in like could we not only do this performance but also create like a uh, interactive piece that starts to give the viewer some of the experience of what it is to be there um, and so the clip that we played in the beginning was kind of like a rough sketch of the intro um, that we were working on mm -hmm. um, and yeah I mean one of the most interesting things that came out of this performance particularly was just like the mass of footage so if you like record 24 hours a day for a week with like you know six different cameras um, just trying to like archive and figure out how to deal with all that was actually its own project that became mm -hmm. really interesting that happened after the performance. I'm sure I'd love to see like the back end of how you're sorting and tagging and naming um, this like incredible archive of Marianne. Um, yeah. I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Um, one of the things that was interesting that we realized was really essential um, and David really brought this from, he has like a journalism background um, was, at, at basically in real time as everything was happening, like taking notes for ourselves constantly, like timestamp and like what's happening, but also like how am I feeling about it or what's it causing me to think about. Um, and that, that was really essential for being able to navigate the footage afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also a really interesting process because you have this kind of like meta, like you know, journaling basically that you're doing while you're having this interaction. Right. Um, as, as someone who thinks a lot about surveillance, automation, and privacy, what surprised you most um, from this experience of offering remote care? Um, I, well, I mean, I guess I'll answer generally and then I'll talk about this one specifically. I think generally the range of reactions that people have to it was really um, interesting and also the sort of amount of like vulnerability and openness they brought to it um, when they participated and I don't know if I, I mean definitely that had to do with knowing there's a human on the other end mm -hmm. um, but at the same time even with that knowledge, you still have this feeling of interacting with what feels like a kind of machine-like system. Um, and so I think what, that, what I'm getting at is this kind of spark of like seeing people really interact in a human way with something that feels, um, you know, like it is driven by AI. And I'm always interested in that kind of like uh, mashup. There, I think there's something something interesting there and something to question about like what um i think generally we feel more comfortable when we feel like we're interacting with humans but there's actually a set of things where we feel more comfortable and we feel like we're not interacting with humans i think and there's been you know studies where it's like people will often um admit things or share information that they might not have shared with a human when you have like two different interview viewers kind of an a b test um and so I, I'm really interested in like, what are those different reactions and sets of behaviors that we have? And in what ways do they start to get more, like, I feel like it's only gonna get murkier. Um, this like talking about one versus the other, I think will not last that, <laughs> that much longer. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious how that shakes out and how we sort out our own feelings and reactions. Um, I, I had one experience where I was like talking to some kind of customer service person um, about like a shipment that didn't arrive. And I was feeling really frustrated that they didn't understand my, what I was trying to say. Um, and then at some point I realized I had like made a typo and I, instead of saying like my thing didn't arrive, I said my thing arrived. And then suddenly I understood like, oh, okay, I'm talking to like a bot and that's why it's, you know, cause a human wouldn't understand it was a typo. Mm -hmm. um, and then suddenly like all the frustration 
I had just like went away and I was like totally calm. I'm like, oh, okay. Like I know how to navigate you now. <laughs> um, and, and that was just, a, you know, I think those kinds of moments come up a lot and I want to know like what, it's one thing to just say like, oh, that was a weird glitch, but like, how does that actually inform how we are interacting with each other? Or what does it mean that I like have more patience for a bot than a person? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, can you tell us maybe some of the, um, some specific things that um, participants feel more comfortable telling this system as opposed to another mm -hmm. human being and maybe what that can be, a, could be attributed to? Yeah. Um, I found one of the one set of things is like those kinds of questions that like you wouldn't necessarily want to like ask a friend because it seems like not significant enough. It's like, does this outfit look okay? Or like, do you think it's like, should I go out and do something tonight or stay in? Or um, like, do you think this thing that I'm eating is all right? Or like, should, you know, should I be cooking or like these kinds of um, questions that maybe you just reflect on yourself more often. Um, but that because I was there, they would sort of take and think like, okay, well, I'll ask this other thing. So it almost became this kind of um, uh, like extension of their own self reflection. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, just like another thing I noticed was um, asking, like there'd be a lot of time. So like on one hand, um, it got really interesting in terms of control. So it's like, in theory, I'm able to see and control everything. On the other hand, like I'm sort of at their, just like waiting on them to ask me to do anything. You know, like I'm sleeping when they sleep and like oh, 24 hours kind of focus on them. Um, and like, even if I go to the bathroom, I like take the computer so in case like they, <laughs> there's a request or something to respond to in the moment, in the meantime. Um, and one thing that uh, I would notice is like, you know, they might just be watching TV or like doing homework or something like that. Um, and then maybe like once an hour, they'd be like, oh, could you change the song or could you answer this question for me? Um, and I really like those moments because I, the idea of just like having a human like sit there and wait for you to like ask them some small question. Yeah. Um, like you would never feel comfortable. Well, I don't know, maybe some people would, but I would never feel comfortable doing that. And I think these people that I'm interacting with wouldn't either, but because I'm sort of obscured behind the system, it, it feels different. And that was, um, that was one of the big considerations in trying to build this is to give a feeling of like some kind of distance. So it's not like someone's like just sitting on your couch, like, you know, what do you need from me? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so those were two areas where I, I really felt that kind of um, rub in a way that felt, I don't know, there's something about it that felt very exciting to me, even if they were very banal mm -hmm. moments. We're going to move into the Q&A shortly. I'm going to ask you one more question, but just as a reminder to um, folks tuned in, please submit your questions to the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen in the Zoom menu. Um, so Lauren, at, what's next for this project? What are you hoping um, to do with it moving forward? Oh, man. Um, Oh, that's such a funny, funny question. I feel right now in my practice, like, um, I'm just rethinking a lot of things and a lot of strategies, um, that the, the issues and questions I think about, um, are still very much in my mind, but I'm, um, I'm just questioning like, what is the effective way to do that? I think something I worry about with these projects is like, they offer some critique, but maybe just for people that already had held this point of view already. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do I open up, open that up more um, and try to reach more people? Um, I think I've also been feeling really um, like I just want to work collaboratively right now. Um, and in some way, like all of my projects, they are sort of these collaborations because I'm 
there are participants and like it, you know, the, these performances don't run without the people that are a part of them. Um, but it also has always felt very like personal in terms of like, I have my own things and like that I'm trying to work out in terms of like identity and understanding. Um, so all that to say, like, I guess I don't know what the next um, project in this kind of direction or series is, but I think that it will be um, a lot more collaborative and just like, I feel like I've, I've exerted a lot of my own like views about these issues um, and trying to build out these systems. And I'm interested in kind of like blowing that up. Um, mm -hmm. And so one project I'm excited about, um, I'm working with uh, Grace Lee and Tony Patrick um, and it's, uh, we're, we're sort of using this process of world building to just think about like um, what, what do we envision for the future? Um, and it started, it, it started with this residency that we did together in 2017 where we um, were doing a similar kind of process. Um, and one of the things that came up in this document that we ended up writing was this idea of like a breakdown 2020. Um, and so now we're in 2020, three years later, and we're like, oh, so <laughs> that happened. Um, so what, uh, what might we see going forward? So the idea is to um, think about these ideas of AI and, and the way the systems are going to shape us um, and, and just be like much more open about that uh, imagining, but also to be pro prototyping. So I'm like building things in the browser that will be like kind of directly manipulating um, the content there to give a sense of like what some of these different realities might look like. So mm -hmm. I know that was super vague, but um, yeah. it's kind of like a new project that I'm excited about. Um, and yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Lauren. I see questions popping in, so I'm going to try to um, feed them to you. So, um, and this is maybe a first question, a good question to start with um, around collaboration. Does Lauren collaborate with staff who work in the care sector? Mm. Good question. Um, yeah, so that is like a, um, di one direction for this project that we're really interested in. And so we've been talking to um, uh, people working in senior homes to see if we might actually um, work with them on some kind of iteration of this project, like using the uh, experience with Marianne as um, sort of a prototype. Um, I think that was a little bit on pause because we we actually had a couple of meetings like that and they happened like right it was like the first week of the shutdown after the pandemic um sort of hit the u.s and it was funny because like we actually they were up for having the meeting um but at the moment like obviously they had much bigger right. things to think about um so yeah that's that's something i'm really um excited and interested in thinking more about and like acknowledging that yeah, this project is like one small um, perspective on this thing that is like, a, you know, a field with a lot of people working in it. Um, and one, you know, personally, I'm wondering, like, what does it mean that AI is increasingly being used um, in these roles? At the same time, realizing, like, um, one of the statistics that we found was like, the care sector is one of the fastest growing sectors in mm -hmm. the country right now. Um, so, uh, that's really interesting to me and also, um, just like, I'm, I, I guess one of the hopeful part of me is hoping that this, our understanding of care might expand and our value of it might increase. Um, and as we start to uh, in interact more with algorithmic systems, maybe realizing like that human factor, that care is one of the things that is very hard to automate. And so maybe that will be one of the jobs that we actually value as much as we should. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, here's another question. Was there anything interesting about, about what AI, IA Susie learned from the start of the week to the end of the week in the sense that AI systems learn and improve as they are deployed in real world applications? Mm, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that, um, with IA Susie and with all of these projects that kind of um, like, I, I, I have this idea of like a learning algorithm in my head. So it's like, it starts out 
um, and we're kind of fumbling to figure out how to interact with each other. And then I think by the end of the week, it, that really evolves. Um, and I would be really interested to do it over like months or a year. It's just kind of logistically tough, but I, I think that would take on like a whole different kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. um, another comment and question, congrats on your project. I'm curious how you relate your artistic pro uh, projects to your open source commitments. Mm. Um, yeah, so I've led this project called P5JS for I guess like seven years now. Um, and it's, it's funny because like on one hand it feels separate, like I don't think of that as my art practice necessarily, although it's part of my practice. Um, on the other hand, I feel like the two are, I'm like very much like everything's all one project in my mind and life. Um, but I think for me, the connections are most direct in thinking about working with people over networks and working, uh, working collaboratively in, dis in distributed ways. And so, um, the open source work that I'm doing is like that very explicitly um, and, and trying to be very explicit about like what are the values that we want to hold while we're doing that work. Um, and with the artwork, it's, it's interesting because it's um, a lot of it is more implicit. Like I leave a lot to ambiguity and to let the viewer kind of decide how they want to participate or what they think about it. Um, and I don't, uh, I hope that the values that I hold are in there, um, but it, I'm not trying to kind of push them on anyone. It's just um, part of what informs the work for me. Um, but I think there, so that's, that's one thing. It's just like, I, I'm fascinated by this, like working with people through these different communication channels and seeing what we can build together. Um, the other thing is like, I'm using software and I'm using a really wide range of tools to build these projects. And some of them are, are open source and sometimes they're not, more often they are. Um, but it causes me a lot to like reflect on what are the rules and boundaries and um, decisions that went into making these tools. And I feel like it becomes really clear when you start to use them and push up against them and realize like, oh, that API endpoint doesn't exist or you can't get that data, but you can get this data or, uh, in order to get this data, I have to make this thing public or whatever. Um, and that's really interesting to see. And I think that informs the open source work a lot because it just, um, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, how do we do almost the opposite of a lot of these patterns that I see? Um, how can we make things that are open, you know, and, and to be aware, like that's the goal, but also like every time you're making a tool, you're kind of embedding it with certain decisions and biases. So, I think it's, it's made me tuned in more to like, okay, yeah, we're trying to make this really open, inclusive tool, but what are all the ways that we're cutting off access while we're doing that? Mm -hmm. okay. Here's a, um, a good question. Great project, Lauren. I'm curious how gender comes into play in this project. A quick Google search shows that upwards of 75% of all caregivers are female and may spend as much as 50% more time providing care than males. Um, and there's a, a link to an article, also when AI is often set up by men, it's, as explained in the New York uh, Times article that's linked in the Q&A. So just, can you talk a little bit about gender? Yeah, totally. Um, I think it's something that, um, you know, like thinking about the first project that I did and it was called Lauren, um, which, you know, obviously that's my name, but also like, the, I, I was thinking really specifically about that question of like, what does it mean that there's a woman behind this? And how would that be different if you, if it was called like John and you knew there was a man watching you, um, presumably. Um, and yeah, I, I guess the, the bigger kind of thing that I, I'm constantly thinking about is just like the amount of care, emotional labor, like all these sorts of like soft, uh labors that are you know often so much more often performed by women expected of women um and compensated a, at a level that is really different than some of the like technical work that's being done um so it's kind of always on my mind and i don't think that i found any like resolutions in this project 
um, uh, um, sorry, what was I going to say? Um, I, I guess I'll go on. Um, oh, no, I remember. So I, something that's interesting about um, doing this work is I've had people comment to me, like I, I w one time was in a discussion with some other artists that all worked with AI and um, the question to me was like, okay, so Lauren, your work is like much less technical. So how do you um, think about these issues? And I just thought that was a funny comment because to build a system like this, you're dealing with like networking and, you know, video streaming and remote, <laughs> you know, Bluetooth devices and like so many different frameworks to see it as just like less technical. Um, I wonder if that's, you know, the way that the project is framed um, or is it the fact that I'm doing it or just like, I, I don't know, I felt that was a very telling comment to just see like the whole idea of like care, um, work or remote care work as like a much less technical thing um yeah so that that's uh those are general thoughts about gender i guess i think it's something i'm like still um yeah i don't have a super like pointed um comment about it but it's more just like something that that creates some of the the substance of what i'm grappling with in these projects Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's a question. Um, it's a great project that brings together many interesting angles. You mentioned being interested in collaboration. And I think the question is, what is maybe like the difference between collaborating via technology um, versus collaborating in person mm. for you? Yeah. Well, I guess we're all getting a perspective on that right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, um, I, uh, it's funny, it's, I was in this discussion this morning actually about access and accessibility. Um, and I think one thing that's, um, I feel like these two competing things. So the point that the, this, um, was being made this morning is that a platform for like, like Zoom, for example, sort of demands that you be like both, you can see, you can hear, you can type, you can multitask. Um, and if you can't do any one of those things, you're sort of at a disadvantage on that platform already. Um, and I'm not sure being together in person puts quite so many um, kind of prerequisites on participation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and I, yeah, I think there, there's a tendency to, when you're working collaboratively online to just like have access cut off in so many different ways um, either unintentionally or because of the tools that you're using or um, because of you know a misunderstanding about what the needs are or a lack of time to discuss what those are um, on the other hand I think there is an opportunity because it's like when you're interacting with these digital systems it's all about kind of codifying behavior and building a structure around that so I think there's an opportunity to be really explicit about what those needs are and to try to design tools that actually prioritize that. Um, uh, so I, like I, another thing I appreciate about collaborating online is like you kind of, if there's a need, you have to kind of just say it. No one's gonna just, you might be like, I'm blind, you know, <laughs> you should know that. Um, or I need you to talk slower. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I see more of that happening because it's like there's no other option. Um, so, I mean, that, that's speaking really di directly about the kind of moment of collaboration. Um, but I think that there's interesting things like just what I love about, you know, the open source work or even these performances is like just getting to work with people that are in an entirely different time zone, country, culture, um, state of mind. Yeah. Etc. You know, and to not just work with them, but like with the P5JS project to like really develop collaborative relationships. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah um, that's not always possible to get those same people together in a room. Um, so yeah, um, I agree. As much as it's been maybe a learning curve collectively, it's de like definitely provided more opportunities um, than not. And so I'm gonna leave you with one last question. 
how do you think creative artistic work can help provoke broader thought and dialogue about cybersecurity? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'm really excited about this program um, because it feels like bringing artists into the conversation is already, um, uh, that's really um, forward thinking. Um, I think like just being able to, one of the things we fall into, I think with building technological systems is just like um, sort of a limited viewpoint of what's possible. Um, or like there's so much momentum sometimes around building tools and building systems that they kind of reinforce themselves and then reinforce the values that built those tools in the first place and propagate more of them. Um, and so I think to break that up, like bringing in people that maybe even have less understanding of the nitty gritty of the technology or what's possible or not. Um, it's so powerful and just like opening those conversations. And like, I see it really directly. Um, I remember when I used to work like as a software developer in the design studio. And so the client would be like, can you do this? And as a developer, I'm already like, no, that's so hard. We can't, you know, but um, there was something powerful about them not knowing what was hard or easy and just being able to, imagine differently and then we usually could build the thing mm -hmm. if we wanted to so um yeah i'm hoping that's what like by bringing artists into these conversations and um that we're able to imagine these possibilities but also like keep going a little bit further so it's not just like oh that was an interesting brainstorming session but like okay what does it look like when we start to build that out and what needs to change in order to make that possible mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lauren. It was such a treat to learn about this project and what the work you're doing with Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Um, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to following along. Um, with that, we're gonna pass it back to Nick for closing notes and remarks. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to you, Salome. It was great to talk. Bye, Lauren. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Salome, and thank you very much, Lauren, for joining us today. Um, I learned a lot. That was very interesting for me. Um, so for everyone who's uh, still watching, thanks so much for joining. Uh, please stay tuned for the next CLTC Arts event. Uh, that will be Greg Niemeyer and his team. That'll be September 16th, 2020, same time. Um, and we'll have a slide up soon with uh, ways to contact Lauren, Salome, and of course us as well. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments about the series and otherwise, you know, follow us on social media and we look forward to seeing you for the next event. Uh, thank you all.